Oh yeah, this is our, our uh, this is a big day in Java one class where we talk about objects and classes and parameters. These are really important concepts in any computer language, but especially so in Java, since Java is an object-oriented programming language. We have to get a definition of what is was what is an actual object, what is the class, how does that work, and then uh, what are parameters that you might send into a method call. So let's jump into that right now. Uh, there's a video out there, but again, that's specific to uh, using NetBeans, and we're using Replit on this. So I wanted. I wanted to uh, I wanted to go over this um, uh, live, uh, and then we'll have Replit in mind when we're doing our, our our assignment here. So let me go find that lecture. I didn't link it. I should have, but I didn't. So let me go find the lecture really fast. Chapter two is all about using objects. Uh, we're not creating them yet, but we are using them all over the place. So we talked about this. I think where to start variables. Yes. We talked about variables. Excuse me. Yeah. If, if I'm in Java two, can I leave the zoom and come back at 12 or. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You can check out yeah. uh, and then come back at 12 and I'll let you back in. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good question. We're trying to find our starting point. Uh, we talked about assignment yesterday, I think, or is that today? Let's see what it says. Yeah. Objects and classes. So. Uh, here we are. This is our starting point for today. All right. So here we are in Java 1. We're looking at objects and classes. What's the difference between the two? A lot of people get these confused, by the way. Uh, they're similar, but they're not the same concept. And so we have to make a differentiation between the two, just so that you don't get confused. So an object, this is their definition, it's an entity that you can manipulate in your programs by calling methods. So an object, you can think of it as a thing. I, I look at objects as being nouns, things you can do stuff with. So an object is a, is a noun. It's a, they use a really generic term here called entity, okay? Because that's, an object can be pretty much anything. Uh, I always like to think of the physical objects, but sometimes they're not even physical. They're, they're just these ideas or something. For example, an example I always use is a cookie. A cookie. Uh, you can think of a cookie as an object, right? You can eat the cookie. You can do something with it. You can eat it, or you can bake it, or you can do something with cookies, right? So, um, so there's that. Keep that picture in your mind. Remember, I, I was mentioning yesterday. I'm kind of a picture-oriented person, so having a little picture in my mind of what I'm trying to describe here is a good. Computer science is pretty abstract to begin with. It's, it's nice to have some concrete examples. So each object belongs to a class. You can have different types of cookies, or maybe say you have chocolate chip cookies. Some ch chocolate chip cookies have six chips in it. Some of them might have uh, seven or eight or nine, if you're lucky, right? So each cookie is unique, but they all are the same class. They're all chocolate chip cookies, but they're not all exactly the same. They have you know, different numbers of chocolate chips and let's say, or some cookies might be a little bit larger than other cookies, who knows, okay? So an object is a member of a class, a class of chocolate chip cookies, right? But uh, an object is a specific chocolate chip cookie. You're looking at it right now, you're just about to eat it, let's say. The example they use here is system.out. System.out out is, uh, is a print stream. This is how we send information to the console. Uh, on the, con the command line, uh, we use system.app to do that. That's an object. So here's our print stream. Inside of it, uh, there's data that helps it figure out where it's supposed to send stuff to. And then there's two methods inside the print stream uh, class. Uh, one is uh, the print line method. The other one is the print method. And we've used, I, I know we've used print line. I'm not sure if we use print, print yet, but we have used those. Uh, the notation they're using here, this little symbol, is not just some random symbol. This is what computer scientists use in, 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 when they're designing systems. It's, this is called UML, or Universal Modeling Language. I've actually talked to the people that created this language. There's four people, actually three people, that put their, their heads together to come up with, they had three different competing uh, visual modeling languages for object oriented computer systems. And they, each one was different. Finally, the industry got really frustrated and they said, okay, 
you're, you're the leaders on this. Why don't you just sit down together and decide how you want to do this? So they lock them in a room for about <laughs> two months and then they come out with this uh, UML diagram. So this is a UML diagram showing the print stream. You put the name of the class, you might show the data inside, and then, and then the bottom part is always going to be the list of the methods, the things you can do with that. So these are the, the verbs. Remember I talked about the objects being the nouns? Well, your verbs are here, and they're actually usually verbs, print line. You're printing something, right? You're doing something with that data. So um, this is a good representation of an object. Now, what are these methods like print and print line? What's a method? That's kind of a strange word. We used to call them functions, uh, but then when, when we went to object-oriented lands, they started calling them methods. This comes from a language called Ada, actual. Actually, it's named after one of the first programmers in, in history, this lady named Ada. Forget her last name, but... Um, and so they named a computer a language after her, and, uh, and that's where uh, object-oriented programming really came from. Uh, I hope I can get in that. I could, I could be wrong about that. I know it's a language that starts with the letter A. <laughs> I don't know if that's correct. Uh, so method uh, is a sequence of instructions that accesses the data of an object. Usually you're manipulating the da data sometimes. Sometimes you're changing it. Sometimes you're just asking for the data that's inside. You're trying to get the information. You're not changing information. Uh, so those are all called methods. So you can manipulate object by calling its methods. Say an object, say you want to change the number of chocolate chips in this chocolate chip cookie, you could add more chocolate chips. Say you like chocolate chips, I think people do. Uh, so you, there's a, perhaps there's a method called add chips and then you say how many more chocolate chips to add to your object. A class declares the methods that you can apply to its objects. So all, all the classes or all the objects of a specific class share the same set of methods. All the print streams have a way to print lines. All the print streams out there have a way to print without printing a, a new line at the end. Um, they all belong to the same class. So the methods kind of belong to the class, whereas the, the data inside the objects belong to each object and they might have different data in them. So it's the class that determines the legal methods for this object. Now we get a lot of compiler issues saying, hey, you, you wrote down this method name and there, on, on, on this object, there's no method called that. I don't know what to do. So the class is what determines what, what are the legal methods that you can call on this object. So here's string greeting, right? We set it equal to hello. We've seen this example before. And then, uh, And then you say greeting.println. Well, this is a problem because greeting is a string and, and strings don't have a print line method. Only, only print streams have a print line method. If you want to print out greeting, this is not the way to do it. This is a string and print line is, isn't one of the methods defined for that. If you say greeting.length, well, there is a dot length method on the string class. So you can actually call this and it will tell you how many characters are in the string. Remember, a string is just a sequence of characters. Could be letters, could be numbers, could be symbols. It's just a sequence of, of, of characters. Now, the other thing that uh, a class specifies is its public interface. You know, those the words we see every once in a while when we're typing in our method names. Uh, sometimes we see the word private. Sometimes we see the word public. There's also a third one called protected. So it's the class that determines what the public interface for that object is. What, what are the verbs this, this noun can respond to? What are the actions or methods this object uh, will respond to and do that? Uh, so this is uh, what the class does is specify what uh, methods you can call on this object. We're looking at an overloaded method. Just because you've used a method name doesn't mean you, you, you can't uh, use that same name twice. The actual method is defined not just by its name, but also by the number of parameters it has going in and the, and the data type it returns. So this is, there's this concept of an overloaded method. When a class declares two methods with the same name, 
but with different parameters, that's considered to be overloaded, has multiple meanings. For example, the print stream class declares a second method. It's also called print line. Okay, so there's two print line methods. Maybe one print line is for printing out numbers, where on the other print line is for printing out strings. They're both called print line, but uh, they work with different parameters. So to the to the Java virtual machine, those are considered two separate methods, even though they have the same name. So here's our first example. There's a version of print line in the print stream that prints out integers. But there's also another one that prints out strings as well. So, um, so let's look at uh, two objects now. We're not talking classes anymore. We're talking about two different specific objects. There, there's one string inside of it. It has, um, it has a string that says hello. And then uh, there's another object up in memory. Same class, it's, it's also a string, but it has a different data in it. It has uh, Mississippi. But notice that the methods that are available to work on that object are the same. Length and two uppercase are two methods that you can call on a string class. Is that all of them? The answer is no, there's a huge list. Strings are one of the most important data types in any computer language. So there's tons, for, especially for strings, those are very robust classes. So, um, so even though there are two different strings, they respond to the same verb. They respond to the same uh, method. This one, I say, if all I said was hello, it would have a length of one, two, three, four, five. But this one, well, Mississippi, M I M I S S S S I C P I 11, maybe if I count correctly. So they have different data inside them, but they're the same. They're from the same class. They're both strings. So let's take a, a closer look at a string method. There's a, a length uh, that. Uh, method that counts the number of characters in the string. So that's just how long the string is. Uh, if, if there's no characters in the string, it would have a length of zero. Even though it exists up in memory, it just doesn't have any data in it. So how long would this string be? Well, let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The base counts. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So perhaps this would return 13 if I counted correctly. We'll see. So if we say, yeah, and it sets n to 13. So you say greeting, which is our string. We say dot, you use dot notation to specify, okay, here's my object, greeting. I want to call this method on that object. So I put a dot there and I say length. You can tell it's a method call because there's an open and closed set of parentheses. It'll call that. That returns a number, which we store in the variable. We assign that value to the variable n. Now we know how long the string is, and we have that number stored in a variable so that we can use it later in our calculation. Here's another uh, method that's available. We saw on the diagram earlier, see there, this two uppercase, what does that do? It creates another string. <laughs> Seems kind of strange. You figure two uppercase would take the current string and change it into a, all uppercase letters, or all capital letters, but it doesn't do that. It leaves the original string alone and it creates another string, a copy of it. But in this case, all of the letters are made capital, capital or, or uppercase. The one thing that's strange about the string class as opposed to other classes is once you create a string, you cannot change it. Very strange. The way they say that in computer speak is they say strings are immutable, immutables which means you can't change it later. So if you want to modify strings, you have to make a copy of it and then add stuff to it a little bit at a time. Why did Java do that? Other languages, that's not the case. Strings are, are changeable, just not in Java. And they did that to make the language easier to manage for the beginning programmer. Remember, Java is leaning towards, say, someone who's new at programming. That's why I, I like using Java as opposed to C++ or C as a starting language because it's not as complicated. It's a simplified version of C. So say you say, uh, we have this river, uh, Mississippi. 
and you want to change it to uppercase, you say river, which is the name of our object, it's a string dot, and then we call the two uppercase methods. Remember, uh, it'll take that, it'll create a new string, just like Mississippi, except all the letters will be capitalized. And now big river will be Mississippi, but all in capital letters. Did we change the first string? And the answer is no. Since strings are immutable, that stays the same, which is, again, strange compared to other computer languages. So it sets Big River to Mississippi. So when applying a method to an object, make sure the method is defined uh, in the appropriate class. So if you say system.out.length, well, length is a, is a method that belongs to the string class, and system.out is a print string class. It doesn't have a length method. So if you try to call this, the compiler, when you try to compile the program, it will say, hey, stop, wait, it doesn't make sense. You're, you're trying to call a method on an object that doesn't have that method defined for it. It's not a string, it's a, it's a print string, okay? So this would create an error in your computer if you try to do that. So here's some self-checks to see how well you're understanding. These self-checks are really helpful. Uh, gives us the answer though right away. So that's not as helpful as I was like, but what you want to do in the book, they have them as well. But how can you compute the length of a string Mississippi? And we said, well, we could just say river.length, because say we, we have that river variable, we stored Mississippi in that river variable, and we just say dot length. And that will return the length. Or say you don't have a variable, you can actually take the string itself in double quotes and put a dot and length at the end, and we'll tell you how long it is. Say you don't want to count it because it's too long. Okay, you just put the word there, put quotes around it and say dot length, and it will tell you the number, how many characters are in that. Here's another self-answering question. If I do this, uh, I'm using Google Slides to actually show a PowerPoint presentation, and so that's why it's not behaving the way I want. But here's another self-check. How can you print out uppercase version of hello world? Well, Hello world is our greeting. So we should say, okay, say, say they're assuming that greeting has hello world in it. We say dot two uppercase. What, that, what does that return? It returns a copy of this greeting, but all in uppercase. So when you print it out, it would be um, all, all in capital letters. Another self-check. Is it legal to call a river dot print line? Why or why not? And the answer is no, it's not legal because a print line is a method of the print string class where river is a string and it does not have a print line method. The variable river is a type string and the print line method is not a method of the string class. So this would also cause the compiler to crash or not crash, but it would cause the compiler to show an error saying, hey, you made a mistake here. Doesn't make sense. Uh, there's one thing about computers, uh, especially compilers, uh, that uh, they're really not smart at all. You learn this as you code it. They're really quite, quite stupid, actually. <laughs> um, obviously, it's clear to me that we want to print out whatever's in river here, but the computer can't understand that. The language we, we talk to computer with is really small. Computers hate ambiguity. You ever watch those TV shows or when they have a movie? And the way you destroy the computer is you give it an unsolvable uh, or complex equation that will, like you try to tell a computer to divide by zero and then it blows up, you know. This is similar. Computers are easily confused. They hate ambiguity. Everything needs to be specific and understandable by the computer or it's gonna do the wrong stuff because again, computers are pretty stupid, okay? Where are all the smarts and the, all the computers? It's the programmers in here and the programmers that write the programs where all the smarts are. It's still you, the programmer. You have this very limited language and very arcane computer to, to try to get it to do what you want. Basically, that's what programming is, is trying to get the computer to do what you want. The computer can do what you want much faster than you can do it. 10,000 times faster, perhaps. But you still have to tell the computer what to do. And that's why the programmer is always there. There's always a job for a programmer, hopefully. <laughs> okay, we're also, we want to talk about parameters. Uh, you see these in math class, right? 
uh, you have f of x. You've ever seen that in math class, f of x. The parameter is x, right? You pass uh, x into this function, and it spits out y, which is our answer or our result. So you can think of uh, our parameter as, as, as the x in the f of x. You know, like in math class, let me just write it on the board so I'm clear what we're doing here. So f of x, teacher, math teachers use it all the time. So this here is called a parameter, right? That's when you're defining the function. But when you're actually calling the function, if you put a value in there, if you actually put a, a value in there like 6, that's called an argument. So even though they're similar arguments and parameters, a lot of teachers don't make a distinction. Computer science teachers make, make a distinction between the two. For the purposes of this chapter, we'll get to arguments later, but we're thinking about when we're defining the method, this thing is called a parameter. Okay. So let's just worry about parameters right now. Well, let's not worry about arguments quite yet. Now, sometimes there's uh, parameters you cannot see. The word implicit is kind of a, a difficult one to understand. I didn't quite understand this the first time I get it. What does implicit mean? Well, implicit means it's implied, which means it's not really there. Or another way you could look at it, if it's, it's, it's kind of invisible, it's, you're not going to see it in the text. So what's the implicit, or what's the invisible parameter to all methods of a specific class? And the answer is, well, the object itself the object where this method is being called on, the inside behind the scenes, the compiler is passing in a reference to the current object that you're calling the method on. That's always available. And since it's always there, they decided, well, why do we have to keep writing it over and over again? Why don't we just get rid of it since it's always there and we'll just make it invisible? So this is one of those things about object oriented programming that makes it hard is there's even if a method has no parameters, the, the parentheses are empty, there still is one parameter. It's the reference to the object this method is working on. Okay? That's your implicit parameter. Here, f of x, x is your explicit parameter because you can see it. It's there, it's right there in the code. But the object, the reference to the object this method is working on, well, that's implied, it's invisible. So it's called an implicit parameter. So here we have uh, system.out.println greeting. Well, what's the imp implicit parameter? Let's see. Let's see if we can figure this out. System.out is an object. We say print line. So uh, print line takes two parameters. One is the greeting that you're trying to print out, but there's also another, that implicit parameter, which is the pointer or the reference to system.out. That's the object that we're trying, we're trying to use that method print line on. So uh, we'll see later when we talk about in later chapters that that actually has a name. And the name of that pointer to itself is called this, okay? So this is a keyword in Java, but we'll learn about this a little bit later. We'll learn about this a little bit later. That's kind of funny. This is actually the word this that we have to learn about. Explicit parameters, well, that's your greeting, right? It's, you can see it. It's right there in, in, in between the parentheses. But that's called an explicit parameter. And you probably notice uh, already that, uh, that uh, you can have methods that don't have any parameters at all, or they don't have any explicit parameters. Again. Every method has at least one parameter, the, impl the implicit parameter of the pointer to self or the pointer to this. So when you say greeting.length, well, it doesn't need any additional information to figure out the length of the string. You're saying, I need to get the length of the string. Does, does, that, does that method need anything else from you to be able to figure that out? Well, the answer is no. It just looks inside itself and say, oh, look, I have seven letters in my string. OK, I'll pass that back. I don't need a parameter coming in any additional data to be able to do the job I need to do is that's figure out the length. I can count characters, 
counts the characters and then tells you how, how long it is. So here's a, a like a graphic that shows you how about how do you go about passing a parameter to the print line method? Well, here's our string. We pass that as a parameter into print line, print strings print line, and it takes that string and sends it out and prints it out on the console, right? On that black window on the bottom in 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 uh, Repl.it. Let's see how much further we want to go. Turn values. Yeah, so we're going to stop there because I want to get to um, uh, what it talks about in the video really quickly before the uh, Java 2 folks come back. So we'll stop there and we'll pick that up tomorrow. But uh, let's uh, switch over then to our assignment. So nice not having to turn around. I've got my second screen finally working. So I was killing me. Every time I needed to move the mouse, I had to turn around. <laughs> Poor Nick. Uh, our first assignment, or our first assignment where we're using uh, methods, is uh, our temperature conversion assignment. There's some things in it that make it kind of difficult. If you watch the video, there's a video here, but the, the video is assuming you're using NetBeans, and we're not using NetBeans. We're using uh, Replit. So I wanted to get you started on this, just so you get past the first part of the video where it's very NetBeans specific, and uh, we can focus on on Replit. So I'm gonna. Uh, what I would suggest right now is just to code along with me. So open up Replit. And like I said, I'll uh, post this video out online so that you can take a, a look at it. If this goes too fast for you. So I'm going to kind of blast through this because I only have 10 minutes. But uh, I'm going to create a new uh, REPL, right? It asks you what languages. These are the languages I chose at the beginning. I'm deciding to use Java as my, my language. Uh, give it a meaningful name. These randomized names are kind of cool, but uh, yeah, they don't really talk about what we're trying to do. And here we're doing, um, I would call this one, uh, let's call it metric uh, conversion. We're going to convert from, uh, you know, your or imperial units to SI units, basically. Everywhere in the world, they use metric system, but for some reason in the United States, we, we're still stuck with the imperial, imperial <laughs> measurement system. Uh, so I create that. And if you remember from last time, we have the test program. Our test program is the one that has the, the main method in it. And then we're gonna create another object or another class which is where we want to do all our calculations. So uh, I think uh, the way I describe it in the video is I add a new file here, and I, I, and I call it uh, metric conversion uh, lib. Lib is for library. Okay, We're going to make this kind of like a library. So we're going to do that. So make sure you create that in Replit. Right now, it doesn't have anything in it. Here's our main method. You zoom in a little bit so you can see it a little bit easier. There we go. Now, we don't want to print out hello world, right? But we do need that main method. This function signature or method signature is never going to change. It's always the same. So you, you never delete that. You, you still need that in main. Now in the video, it says to change this to like a metric conversion tester or something. Now we're going to have to leave that main class there. Replit requires that first class, I think, to be main, although maybe not, but I think so. What do we want to do? Well, we want to say, well, we're going to create this, uh, this temperature. Let's say... Um, we say double. Double is a data type that can store real numbers. That means a number that has a decimal point and things to the right of the decimal. So we say double, and we're going to call that f temp. 
for the Fahrenheit temperature. And we're trying to go from the Fahrenheit temperature to uh, Celsius, right? Or yeah, Celsius. So we're, we're gonna just temporarily set this to a number that we know the conversion of. The way the metro system works is zero in Celsius is when water freezes. Uh, 212 degrees is when water boils, right? Which is 100 degrees in Celsius, right? So we're gonna put in a value for our Fahrenheit temperature as 212. We're hard coding this, at least for now, okay? And then what we wanna do is we wanna say this, um, we would say double, well, actually let's add another variable up here called C temp, and this is gonna be our Celsius temperature. Okay? And that's also a double. You can do that, uh, uh, define uh, multiple variables on the same line. You can do it that, by using a comma. Notice the compiler's complaining right here. It's telling you, hey, you created this variable, but you're not using it yet. Well, of course not. I haven't written the code yet, okay? But it is trying to help you, okay? It's trying to help you um, write code that makes sense. So he says, you just created these two variables, but you're not using them yet. Okay, well, I'll start using them now. So we're trying to, we, ha we know the Fahrenheit temperature, but now we're trying to figure out uh, what the Celsius temperature is. So we say C temp, which is our, our Celsius temperature. And we wanna say, well, we wanna use our li library. So we, we say metric, oh, it's actually helping me now, conversion lib. That's the name of our other class, right? Dot, and we're gonna call this one F2C. We're breaking a few rules here. Well, what rule are we breaking? The answer is, um, you're not supposed to use capital letters uh, in, in method names uh, to start with, but in this case, since it's Fahrenheit and the C's capitalized, I decide I'm gonna bend that rule a little bit. Now that's just a, a style guideline. The compiler doesn't care really, but most programmers might. That conversion, yeah, there should be no T, you're right. Okay, very good, thank you, good eyes. I appreciate when students point out my mistakes. Some, te some teachers don't appreciate that. I'm not one of those teachers. If I mess up, please let me know. I learned something and everyone else learned something too. I'm not uh, an egotistical uh, teacher. I don't, I'm not know all, I don't know everything. And I, I always thank students who help me out. So thank you. Uh, so here, well, what do we need to be able to convert uh, from Fahrenheit to Celsius? And what we need is a parameter that has the Fahrenheit temperature we're trying to convert. So we would say F temp here. That's our, that's our, that's the argument that satisfies our parameter. Now, every, every program that you're ever gonna write starts with, uh, well, has three parts to it, okay? There's an input part, there's an output part. Well, it goes in this order, input, and then processing, and then output. Every program you're ever gonna see for the rest of your life has those three pieces in it. They have some kind of input, you do some kind of processing, and then <clears throat> you have some kind of output. If the input was the same as the output, then there'd be no reason to have the program because you're not transforming the data into something new, right? So every program has those three parts. It's kind of like going to In-N-Out Burger, right? So they have a new In-N-Out burger down in Kaiser. Has anyone been there, been there yet? There's an input part. <laughs> you eat the, the burger. There's a processing part when you digest the food. And we won't talk about the output part. But it's got three parts. So you can think of a program having always, every program you're ever going to see, ever going to write, ever going to use has those three parts. So our first part is, well, we have to have input. And our input here is our Fahrenheit temperature. And then, um, and then uh, our processing part is gonna be inside this metric conversion library. And then our output part is we need to tell the user, hey, we did the conversion, they need to be able to see it. So we're gonna use our, our system.out.out.print line. And we might say something like this. Um, a Celsius 
Is that how you spell Celsius? I think so. Uh, temperature is, yeah, is, and maybe a space. You don't want the, the temperature to be smashed up against the, the word is, so you put an extra space there to give it a little space. And then you would add on to that the C temp. And that's the C temp that we hopefully calculated in our, our little function there. And then put a semicolon at the end. And what that will do is we'll take the result of our uh, Fahrenheit to Celsius uh, method and print it out so that the user can see the result. It doesn't make a lot of sense to go through the process of converting from Fahrenheit to Celsius if you don't show it to the user somehow, or it's not used for something. So this is our output part. Here's our input. I'll even label it. Input, that's our input. Here's uh, our processing. And then here's our output part. Yes, we do. Yeah, so I'm gonna show you that uh, on thir Thursday, how to do that. You wanna know now? Okay, good. Are you using a scanner or? Are you using a scanner or using a, a, like a, a scanner? Yeah, a scanner's a good way to do it. So, so we'll go over that on Thursday and how to do that. But yeah, someone's ahead of the game now. And then output, that's our output part. But this program doesn't do anything. It's gonna crash. Well, it's not gonna crash. It's not gonna compile. And why isn't that? Well, it says, hey, I don't know what this metric conversion library is. We created this file, but we didn't put any code in there, okay? So this, this code, well, you'll have to get off the video, okay? So take a look at the video that's associated with this and it tells you how to create this class, this metric conversion library. And so rely on the video for that and then fill in the code that you see there here and then run the program and then it should work, okay? And I'll have this filled in for next time as well. But uh, here's the, this is our test program. This is our tester. You still have to write the library that does the conversion. So watch the video, use that video to tell you what to put in the metric conversion class. I wanted to give you the main method uh, in class today so you wouldn't be confused but then watch the video to figure out how to do the actual equation. Cause you have to put the equation for doing, you know, the standard equation for, for figuring out for, uh, the Celsius temperature from the Fahrenheit temperature, but that's all in the video. All right, any questions there? Celsius, I am misspelling it. <laughs> am I misspelling it? Celsius, you're right, I, I did misspell it. It didn't look right to me, that's why I was saying that. Thank you. See, I, I always thank students that help me out, thank you. English is my second language, so I use that as an excuse. <laughs> I didn't speak English when I was a kid. So. For uh, F to C, is it, is it um, lowercase f, capital two, capital C? Yeah, that's what I was saying at the beginning, is I'm kind of breaking the style guideline by putting a capital F there. Uh, but uh, typically, you wouldn't, you wouldn't capitalize the F. But uh, since the C is capitalized, I'm going, oh, that looks kind of funny. So I'm gonna capitalize the F. So I'm breaking a style guideline, but again, it doesn't break the language, right? And in the video, I kind of break the rules there too. So I was trying to keep the name the same as the video. Good question though, very good question. Any other questions before we switch over to Java 2 land? Yeah, I'd like to see that actually. Yeah, no. And I also encourage students to try it their own way. Uh, my way is a way to do it. It may not even be the best way to do it. Yeah, that's what we're going to do on Thursday. Yeah, just like that. Very good. Excellent. We've got some cool programmers in this class already. That's great. Okay, so if you're in Java 1, uh, you can continue on with this. Take a look at the video. It tells you what to do for the metric uh, conversion lab uh, part of the program. Work on that. And then... Um, I'm switching over to Java 2 uh, land right now. So if Java 1 folks, if you wanna work asynchronously, which means you can log off if you'd like, you can do so. Um, and then take a look at that video because the video is gonna tell you what to do. Where's that video? It's right, let's go back. 